Hi, so today we're starting to tackle a subject. It's pretty heavy, but we'll see where we go and we'll take it from here. So what we're looking at is some Advanced Dungeons and Dragons 1st Edition. And we're going to try and attempt to figure out if you're a new player to AD&D 1st Ed, how do you get into it? Now, this is a big, big topic. We'll see how we go, or if it even makes the light of day. All right, let's get started. Like all games in D&D, the first thing you need are books. Ideally, these three books, Dungeon Master's Guide, Player's Handbook, Monster Manual, as many dice as you could muster, more than that. Pens and paper, pencils, rubbers, rulers, graph paper, and a few modules. But, before all that starts, you need to work out why you're playing. Especially in the modern era where you've got 5th edition which is so much easier to pick up and run with for the uninitiated player. This is going to be something that's I'm assuming as someone who's interested and wants to get into 1st edition, doesn't know how, and doesn't know how to get into it, jump into it, run with it, but has some experience with 5th ed, and at least an idea of role playing games in general. If you're brand new, totally uninitiated, and never seen a role playing game in your life, this can get messy. So, this isn't going to be a 5th versus 1st but it's very much, this is how First Ed runs and this is what you need to remember when you're playing it type of, type of video. Alright, so let's start from the top. You need players, you need a DM and that's pretty much where it starts. If you've got your friends that are like-minded that want to have a jump into First Edition Picking up these books is good, but it's not going to help you. Making a character is completely different than it is in the modern era, or in anything post-1985, and that's the first hurdle. Limited in classes, in races, it all seems so limited, but it's really not. Then you've got a DM's guide which tells you things but doesn't tell you how to do things because they're assuming that you already know how to do things and a monster manual filled with monsters which are doubled up in here at the back with the experience points for each mission for each monster for other missions but this can provide a little bit more in in depth description especially when a player character is trying to work with something wants to build a character and it refers to the monster manual and the monster manual then refers to the DM's guide so yes this is the purview of the players and separate from these but they're all linked and it's good for one being the DM to understand how all three are linked making notes copious amounts of notes about what a player is going to need you can find those, uh, there's a great many texts and videos online, but we'll try and cover some here as well. Okay, so for the new DM, picking up these books for the first time, and for the new players <coughs> who may not have experienced anything beyond 5th edition, there's a number of different items, points of reference. First of all, the book is a lot of words, not a lot of glossy pictures, a lot of words and charts. So there are a number of things that the DM needs to work out first. Whoever's going to be the DM or the campaign play have an agreement upon how the, uh, there's the social contract as it's often referred to for play and creation. So that way 
you can have a, an amount of uniformity with all the games. So the DM needs to work out what's in and out. And there are certain things that are worth dropping for the ease of use. Some things that are more interesting if you keep them in and then work out later whether or not it's worth adding. So you can always take away, but whether or not you add something after is always harder. Especially once a campaign starts. You might think, yep, racial limits, we're not having them, that's a silly idea. But then you realise, wow, that is actually really powerful. And this is the best way of, of maintaining that power balance. And so on. So it's best to work out these things. Because you can always say, yep, we're imposing them. And then later say, no, we're not. We're not having racial charts for who can do what. But then it does change the nature of the game. But that's okay. Because the way to play this game is by having fun and doing it. Alright, so I've made up a quick list of items, of points of interest that need to be addressed, first of all. And we're going to go through some of those. Okay, thank you. So probably alignment is the first port of call. And working out whether or not alignment charts are required. Yes, they have alignment charts. So you can track how a character deviates from his or her alignment. Some of this is covered in the DM's guide as well. Where they try and explain a little bit more from a DM's point of view. But ultimately, you guys who play need to work out where you think certain things fit. Sometimes it's easier to work out with uh, certain characters. So you've got Brian Mills from Taken, who's a neutral good type of a character. You've got most assassins, well all assassins are evil of some description, but the James Bonds of this world are lawful evil. And so on. You have to sort of work these things out. And again, as the DM and as the players working together, because in the modern era the game would be more collaborative rather than the DM dictating, but the DM still has to have final say on how it works. So with alignment, you also get alignment languages, and these are all points that need to be addressed as well to worthy enough to be dropped off. But uh, again, this is where something like having deities is really important because you've got people who follow a deity will live to the code of that deity. And then, you know, in, when you're thinking about the medieval era, everyone worshipped something. It wasn't common, especially in a game like, in a universe like uh, Dungeons and Dragons where the gods do walk the earth. And demons and devils and monsters do exist. You can try to not believe in them as much as possible, but they do, and they do have an impact. So alignment, alignment languages, probably the first things that need to be dealt with. And we move on to the next point. So the next thing to think about is experience and gaining experience levels. There are some character classes, such as the Thief, that progress considerably faster than others. And some that are quite slow. Paladins and magic users being among that list. 
So level progression is something that's important to get through, especially for the lower levels. Uh, as on paper, they need to be tutored by classes of the same, uh, at least several levels higher. And as well as uh, a gold piece, as of um, 1500 gold pieces per week. And it's one week per level, so on. So spend a lot of money, spend a lot of time. If you go up to the second level, it's going to cost you 3,000 gold pieces and two weeks of training to get all the skills required. As a DM you need to work out this. And as players you need to work out where it goes. Some of it makes sense. And maybe the different rules across the, across the way come into play. So you might be able to self-train for the first two or three levels. But then after that, needing a tutor of at least 7th level and so on and then generally once you get to what's called your name level such as ninth level for a paladin you no longer need tutelage it's just spending money and time practicing and all of this is conditional to the characters already practicing every day with their craft so gaining levels is quite a monumentous occasion for many. You get a few extra hit points, you get some better to hit, and you gain weapon proficiencies, and in some cases characters learn spells where they have to go and learn those spells from someone else. So you still need to learn these things. And with characters that have almost powers, they improve and get better because you have to be a good paladin not just good but you need to be a good paladin and if you're a fighter you have your own benefits that come through so it's understanding where they where that travels so part of the level leveling up experience is the required number of experience points so remember an orc would have approximately 13 to 15 experience points per orc and this is where experience points for gold and treasure and magic items needs to be worked out as well. You could have one, one mission where there's lots of gold and the experience points of gold to XP value is 1 to 10. Well, there could be very little gold and st or strong defenders, in which case it's a 1 to 1. And then magical items and the use of spells and scrolls all count to experience points. Picking up a picking up and identifying a magical sword plus one is roughly around the 400 500 points of experience. And that sort of thing. So you just need to work out how you want to do levels, and especially in the game where some of the campaigns can be for quite a while and the players will be stuck. Uh, underground for quite a length of time. You've got these middling levels where the the XP bottle sometimes narrows and sometimes broadens. And that's what you've got to sort of figure out. How is that going to work? Sometimes it's a matter of we'll see how it works. But then you really need to have a an idea of a plan if you wish to take that up, and that's why it's on the list of things you need to look at. Because just letting people progress quickly and rapidly can sometimes lead to some very, very powerful characters, very quickly. So, working out experience points and level advancement. That's another one of those little nuances. For the DM, understanding how dice work is very important. And I don't just mean understanding that you roll and there's a value, but knowing what 3d6 does as an output 
dice is rolling 46. I'm discarding one. As it says in the book, the dice are the tools of the DM, and the DM needs to understand how those tools work. The infamous bell curve for 3d6, flat 3d6, and then of course that gets skewed, pushing everything over this way once you add a few extra dice, or even a, a, one dice. But also understanding how the percentages work. So a 1 in 6 is about 16%, obviously a 2 in 6 is 1 third. D8s run in 12.5%, and then you've got the D10s which are 10%, and so on. So when someone has a percentage chance of doing something, you don't always have to roll a d20, you can sometimes roll a d8. And that gives you more of an idea of, of the chance of something happening, or what effect that has. First edition D&D is a game with less rules defining outcomes, but more interpretations and judgments. So you might want to do something, the player says I want to do something, they still need to succeed at it, but how well do they succeed? You might roll a d10 and then decide, okay, that's how many rounds it's going to take. And take eight rounds. Or they might have a something in d12 chance because of the, the nature of the 12s and so on. And so it's not always about success and failure, sometimes it just has a, a measured, a weighted measure of outcome, which is important. And as it says also, something like falling, 1d6, but it can go up to d8 if there are hazards at the bottom, or even as high as d10, and that's every 10 foot. So there's nothing that's hard and fast about a particular rule. And there are plenty of areas where there's a throwaway line where they talk about, but you can change it on this instance. And that's why these books, the strength and weaknesses of them, they've got a lot in them. You've just got to know how to find it. Knowing that it's not in any sort of particular order, you just have to find where this is versus that. And that's just experience of the DM and the players working together sometimes. So, understanding dice is a key part to first edition D&D. Sometimes you'll even see that just there's a 75% chance of something reflected as a 1 to 3 on a D4. For so that particular D4, you use the numbers on the bottom, and so on. Which is different to rolling 75%. Potentially. Rolling multiple dice produces a more of a, an even effect, and that's what you need to look at. That's where something like the broadswords versus the longsword debate. You've got 2d8 versus 1d8, and so on. Knowing how the dice work, and how the ratios work. Yes, there's a little bit of maths, but it doesn't take long to understand. So working out dice is important, especially for something like ability scores. Because player characters like to invest in their ability scores. Even though in first edition D&D, it's really these top scores here that make any effect, or the bottom scores. So normal humans Normal characters exist between the 9 to 12, 10, 11, 12. Player characters should have that slightly shifted this way to the right to create that curve over to the more 11 to 14. And that's what that additional dice does. That just rolling that extra die for the for the D, for the stats. 
Okay. Cover a little bit on dice. On the question of sonics, don't do it. So when it comes to the racial characteristics, there's a temptation to say, let's remove them all. And give everybody whatever they want. But demi-humans are already rather quite powerful and dwarves and half-orcs particularly with 19 constitution again potentially up to plus five hit points per level can become rather overpowered. And these take these charts here take into consideration the racial preferences for and personalities for particular classes and professions. Elves, they love magic and are proficient with magic. Half elves, like humans, touch of everything. And it also comes down to who's being trained for what. So the human, the benefit of the human is that the human can be anything to an unlimited level. So you'll only get humans or classes of over 12th level, 12th level or higher, that are human. And some of that becomes apparent when you look at the different classes. So the, they gain specific bonuses of once they get certain levels. And that's where the humans gain an advantage in the long game as they've got some of the shortest lives. They always live for thousands of years, 1500 years. So they can pretty much just sit back and do anything. And so part of their level limitations are included with their lack of focus. So don't discard them straight away. Same too with the racial stat bonuses, which sort of make a fair bit of sense. And again, it's all about balancing because these uh, different races have more abilities and bonuses. Some of them gain some additional buffs. So especially races like the Elf. Now versus 5th Ed as an example, and as I said not to try and make it a 1st versus 5th, but you'll see the number of races being rather limited by comparison, being the Dwarf, Elf, Gnome, Half Elf, Halfling, Half Orc and Human. Doesn't detract from anything. But, it's just a point to remember. So again with the text wall, there's a lot to describe about what the different species can do and what the races bring. And that's not so much something that the DM or the new players have to think about, but it's just if you've got a fifth ed mentality or mindset, then there are certain things that make it different. That's one of them. And this chart for racial preference, it's really not so much player versus player, but when the players interact with NPCs of those races. So if the party rock up to the Gnome King's palace, the half orc may have to sleep on the floor or even outside.
And that's pretty much how it works. Some races just sort of get along, go along to get along. And others kind of don't. Dwarves and elves have always had a thing against each other. And the next step is about classes. The big thing with classes is really about weapons, the weapon limitations and armor. And again, a lot of it's to do with balance. So one of the points to remember is if you decide, nope, anyone can use anything, then what are you taking away from one class as a benefit? So the fighter that can use any armor and any shield and any weapon, and then you say the cleric can use any armor, any weapon, any shield, and they have spell casting and they have turning. Suddenly people think, well, why am I being a fighter? And so on. So some of it's to do with a bit of uh, balancing, game balance. It's not intentionally meant to detract from anything. And hit points. So the last point of all of this is just about hit points. What happens when you roll that one? And what should you do when you roll that one? That, that's what the DM needs to think of next. And that's really where you've got the big fighter that's got the 18 double zero strength, that's got the big everything and suddenly rolls a one for hit points and has three hit points. What do you do about that? So it's not that there's nothing to be done, but the DM just needs to be aware and be ready to adjust. If everyone has maximum hit points, then the challenges need to be increased or changed to adjust. And conversely, if the, the players have less than average hit points, then the challenges need to be decreased or changed. It's just the way it works for the maximum enjoyment for everybody and to maintain game balance. Then we're back into classes again. But for the most part, that's really all that you need to sort of think about. So this is a wee part one of the, uh, so you want to start to get into the first edition. And we'll stick with some of the, these are the big ticket items that we've been talking about. And well and truly, the next one, if there's a next one, will be a little bit more about how to handle some of the more nuanced rules that people are familiar with that didn't exist yet. But by all means, give this game a chance at its full level and see how it goes because to um, ignore some of these things and to think oh no that's just weird and I'm ignoring that without giving it a shot can detract from what it is that the game was meant to be about we haven't even talked about equipping the characters but maybe we'll do that next time. Alright. So this will be part one. We'll get part two up and running as soon as possible. And thank you for your time.